Hi, welcome to this week's Amazing If podcast. We're Sarah and Helen, the founders of Amazing If, a business all about helping people have happy careers. And this week, we're continuing our series on confidence gremlins, where we talk about the top 10 confidence gremlins that get in our way at work. And our focus today is a fear of failing, so something that I think most of us experience at some point during our careers. Before we get stuck into uh, failing, which sounds like it could end up being quite negative, but I promise you we, we will turn it around. Before we get stuck into um, failing today. Let's talk a little bit about what a confidence gremlin is and why they matter. So confidence gremlins are the things that hold us back. They matter because they stop us from doing the things that will make us better at our jobs and sometimes even stop us from doing the things that are really important to us and make us really happy. We say it every week, but we'll keep saying it in the hope that we'll convince you. Everybody does have confidence gremlins. Even those people who seem uber confident or always seem to be happy doing everything and anything have some confidence gremlins hidden away somewhere. I can guarantee it. I'm yet to meet somebody who doesn't have a confidence gremlin, <laughs> but maybe that day will come, I don't know. And we have multiple. Yes, which mainly we've talked about through the whole of this um, <laughs> these podcasts, so people are probably getting more and more familiar with them as we go through. So the trick really with confidence gremlins is to know what yours are and then really think when you know what they are, what you're actually going to do about them. And we all experience some confidence gremlins, you know, at different points in our career. Sometimes a fear of failing can be particularly prominent because maybe you're in a new role or you're feeling a bit exposed. Maybe you've just joined a new company, you're working for somebody different. So it's sometimes something you experience for a little while or sometimes it's something that you experience over a longer period of time, which is where we always encourage people to take action continuously and regularly. So let's get into a fear of failing. So Helen, perhaps uh, we'll just start by thinking a bit about how does this fear really hold people back in your experience? Well, I think I have, I have personal experience of this one as well as kind of working with lots of people where I've seen it. I think it gets in people's way because I think people have sometimes a desire to present a kind of perfect front that they've never failed before, they won't fail, they're great at their job, they're kind of absolutely perfect. And in order to do that, you might kind of not put yourself into risky situations where you might fail. Uh, maybe you're going to over prepare so it looks like that you know everything. You're not going to put forward a different point of view in case some people think it's wrong. And I think as well, if you're really fixated on this idea of I mustn't fail and people will think badly of me if I fail, then you can obsess over the small things that you do and you can spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I think for me personally, I have a value of achievement. And so I think, I, you know, I still have to some extent this confidence gremlin uh, because of it. I've, I've learned to manage it a lot more now. Actually, I'll, I'll talk about an experience when I actually failed and I realised that it was good to fail. But I think having, for me, having this value of achievement actually makes a fear of failure quite prominent because I think, well, if I fail, I'm not achieving. And it can yeah. create this kind of conflict between, you know, I always want to be successful and achieving and moving forward. And even though I know it's not true, there's still something inside you that thinks, well, failure is really counter to that. And therefore it's kind of, I might not take as many big risks as I can because I want to look like I'm achieving and being yeah, successful. Yeah. Well, I think it's a tough almost word, isn't it? Because actually even the idea of failing, most of us would associate that as being a bad thing. Yeah. So even when you kind of go to school, if you fail an exam or if you fail a class... Or if you fail something, it just if you fail your driving test, uh, which I might have done the first time. Uh, or and, any, any... and the second for me. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. All I right. did not know that. <laughs> no. um, so even... I can drive now really yeah. well. Excellent. <laughs> I think those kind of things is where we get our reference points from for failing. So those kind of early experiences, actually, they're very black and white. And if you fail, it feels terrible and mm. very tough. And actually, it can feel quite exposing, quite embarrassing. And so often you get to the point of we're all human, so you have this sort of fight or flight mechanism. And so you want to protect yourself from failing because that feels like something where you're exposing yourself. Yeah. So actually it takes a lot of bravery and courage, I think, to actually approach things in a way where things might not be perfect and to recognise that that might be a learning opportunity. Because, of course, everyone says, oh, you know, it's great to fail because you're going to learn. You get all those, like, cheesy quotes. <laughs> yeah. But then the reality of doing that, I think, is quite tough. It's, and I think that cheesy quote is so funny because I do, I do believe that it is good to chalk up some failures yeah, yeah. because I think you really do learn about how to respond to them, so how not to dwell on them for hours and days and weeks and beat yourself up. And also, I think in failing, you can actually come across, you know, a lot stronger. So got quite a few years ago, I was on a big project. I was kind of the kind of hanging up with a lot of the marketing activity on it. And there was a big hiccup, let's put it that way, with the project. <laughs> it's a really big hiccup. And um, my role was 
Uh, well, ideally, I should have avoided that hiccup. It shouldn't have happened. And I took that on as a kind of a personal failure that I kind of bid across the project a little bit more to prevent that. I, in hindsight, I don't know, but I took it at the time very personally. And I had to spend sort of about two, three weeks basically recovering that failure. And that involved a lot of internal stakeholder management and a lot of external customer comms, lots of senior people who were kind of all over the project and being very on to fix it for about three yeah. weeks and turned it around. And actually, I was held in higher regard after having fixed that problem yeah. than had the problem never have occurred. And so you hear all of these things about, oh, it's good to fail more, and it sounds really flippant. Yeah. And I don't quite know how not to make it sound flippant, except to say, actually, the times when I have failed, in the moment, it's felt pretty horrible, but on reflection, either because I've learned something about how I've dealt with that failure or because as a result of managing through it, other people have thought differently about my skill set. It's actually been better for it. Yeah. So do you think that actually one of the things that we're suggesting that people might find useful is think about how you almost respond to those failures? And that's almost one of the kind of top tips or things to think about is not only are you going to fail some of the time, because in reality, no one is perfect, so it is yeah. going to happen. And actually, are you better focusing your energy on, well, what do you do when things don't go to plan? Yeah, definitely. I think the first thing people can do is put themselves in situations where they might fail. Yeah. Um, and maybe don't do like a massive, a massive one to begin with. Yeah. So there could be small situations, maybe a small, a small meeting or a project that you've thought, oh, I wouldn't want to do that because I don't know enough or whatever the thing is. Put yourself in a situation where you think you might fail and get used to, used to doing that. Yeah. Um, and then I think, when it occurs that you will fail and again there's another kind of flippant quote that if you're not failing you're kind of not trying hard enough so I think I think it's good if you're not failing maybe you're not pushing like, yourself think about it yeah, yeah think about what am I not doing when you do do that I think try not to it's hard when it's in the moment but try not to make your first reaction kind of doom and gloom and oh gosh is this the end and think okay I'm just got to get through this and then once you've kind of solved the problem then take a step back and think what have I learned from it and I think Sometimes if you think in that way, there's this failure that's happened, I've got a problem, I've just got to fix it right now, just got to fix it, I'm not going to think about what this says about me. Yeah. And then at the end of it, you think, I'm going to reflect on what I've learned from this. It might give you a bit of objectivity as well, which might help you not go down some very internal, what does this say about me yeah. kind of issue. Well, I think there's in potentially a bit of a difference between almost proactive failure and reactive failure so I think often the times that I've failed I hadn't known that I was going to fail yeah versus what, yeah. You've, what you've just described is actually sometimes you might put yourself in situations where you think I'm not sure how I'm going to get on here yeah. there's at least a potential that this might not be absolutely perfect and that's maybe because you're presenting in front of a large audience for the first time or maybe you're doing some work that you're just less familiar with yeah you, you don't have as much technical knowledge but you still volunteer for it because you think I appreciate I might not be perfect at this and there is a risk of failing to an extent and so I'm actually I'm doing this for the learning experience and I can manage that one way and I think the other way is when something just goes wrong that you hadn't anticipated yeah and I think for me it's those second ones where particularly how you react to something happen happening that you just didn't you didn't know it was going to go wrong either an external factor or well basically you just got something wrong on the day that you didn't think about yeah that's where one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was you can kind of give yourself 24 hours to keep worrying about <laughs> it but then after that 24 hours you've got to move on and actually you've got to move on to what did you learn so in the meantime of course you should be fixing it but actually you can't wallow for too long I think it's um having a quest for learning rather than a quest for perfection yeah so if you kind of if you hold yourself to that kind of esteem that is really stressful I've got to be perfect at everything I do it's going to influence the things that you put yourself forward for and it's just going to be stressful to be honest you're probably going to be comparing yourself to other people and it's it's not going to be the basis for your happy career. Whereas I think if you put yourself kind of more on a quest for learning, then failure is just part of that. And you're looking more at, OK, well, what would I do differently next time? It's just a different, it's a different mindset. I think it's a, that what we've talked a little bit about before in terms of fixed and growth mindset yeah, that's as well. True. The fixed mindset is very aligned to this kind of quest for perfection, whereas a growth mindset is much more about learning. And I think for some people, for example, they might avoid a horizontal job move because they might think, 
I just need to stay in my discipline, for example, in my company, because that's what I'm good at and that's what I know. And if I did something, you know, too different from that, I might not be as good. Whereas actually taking on maybe a horizontal job move or a secondment, you might not be as good. You know, I might go out of a marketing remit and might not be as good. But what that might say to my peers and my manager might be that I have got an ability to grow and learn and not just to kind of limit myself by being kind of perfect all the time. Yeah. Well, I think I personally did exactly that. I moved out of my discipline of marketing yeah. into a completely other different area for actually for three and a half years in the end. And what I found through that period is that's probably the three and a half years I've learned the most in my career. Yeah. But it's also the time where I failed the most, found it the toughest, yeah. had to be the most resilient. Yeah. You know, you learn a heck of a lot of really useful things by doing that. But you you kind of have to be prepared to sort of take a bit of a risk in the first place. So we've talked a bit about taking risks, but calculated risks, yeah. think, think about those risks, how you respond to failure when it does happen, whether you expected it or, or not potentially, having that, this growth mindset and thinking about failure in terms of what you can learn and reflect on as a result. Any other hints or tips for people who kind of say this is really something that gets in their way, anything else they should be thinking about? I think you touched on that earlier, which is about kind of putting a time limit around how yeah. much you're going to wallow if I can say that yeah. and, I've, and I've done this so I've kind of not been mean so when things go wrong it's very easy to kind of look at yourself and be like oh what could I have done differently and what might they think of me yeah. and just dwell on that a little bit too much and I think ideally give yourself like you said 24 hours and move on a way I find really helpful is just to write it down because I think when things are in your head they can magnify and seem bigger than they are I think if you can just write down kind of the situation you know what happened where I think I could have improved what I want to do next and what what next might be get some feedback try a different approach whatever that looks like I think when you are able to write it down and put a bit of an action plan it stops being this horrible internal thing that's going on that you're just going to take forward with you day after day and for me to be honest writing a list and a good night's sleep. I can move on after those things. I'm not yeah. going to let myself be kind of dragged down by the situation beyond that. I think that is, if you can get that habit, that will help. Yeah, and I find, I think you and I are probably a bit different to this extent in that I sort of definitely probably think about things a lot more than you would in terms of I would overthink it. I'd still be thinking about it four weeks later. Yeah. I can pretty much name everything I've ever got wrong at work, I think, ever. <laughs> like, I, I can, like, I'm sort of, I, I like to think that I don't wallow as much, but certainly I do, I'm definitely a thinker and a reflector. One of the things that I find really useful when things haven't gone to plan is sometimes I need to talk to somebody about it relatively quickly, but who's not directly involved in the context. Yeah. So actually somebody who I think maybe understands my context, but maybe who I'm not working with day to day, just to get their perspective, often their pragmatism, they're more able to take a step back from the situation than me and help me to stop reflecting too much and stop overthinking it because they will say, well, you do realise that in the scheme of things, A, half the people probably weren't listening or secondly, they probably won't remember on Monday. You know, I remember going to a board meeting and thinking, that didn't go, 90% of it went to plan, but 10% of it didn't. And obviously all I could think about was that 10%. And talking to somebody afterwards, he said, you do realise by Monday, like these people have all got really important jobs and they're all very busy. Not a single person will be thinking about this other than you. (laughs) And then that is in some ways soul destroying, (laughs) but but in other ways helps you to restore your soul in that you just think, well, no one else is worrying about it. And so actually, why would I want to dedicate lots of my own brain power time and energy to thinking about it because nobody else is yeah and so actually then just move on and then try and work out what you would do differently and make sure you've captured that somewhere it makes me think of last tip on this from me i think is about having a good support network and i think this is useful for all of your confidence gremlins to be honest because when you test them it can feel difficult and uncomfortable and it's really good to have somebody who you can maybe talk to about that but i think with this one particularly a fear of failing it is really useful to know those people who can support you and that might be somebody who is like you so maybe a peer who's got a job a bit like you maybe it is somebody who challenges you so that person who's going come on, let's get a bit of perspective. What have you learned from this situation? It can be an advisor, like a mentor or something like that. So they might say, this happened to me a couple of years ago. This is what I did. And you can learn from that. Or maybe just somebody who inspires you, who makes you think, okay, 
this is a really small thing in the grand scheme of things. I can I can get excited about something else. I think whichever one of those kind of people that it falls into, I think it's worth thinking, what does my support network look like? Have I got one of those types of people that if something's really difficult and challenging at work, whether I've failed or I'm putting myself in a situation where I'm likely to, yeah. have I got that support structure in place that I can you know, work with to boost my confidence? Yeah, and we've talked about it a few times on different confidence gremlins, but not feeling like you always have to do this stuff alone. Yeah. You know, these are um, overcoming any confidence gremlin is tough. It takes time. And actually, if you're trying to do this in isolation, I think you'll actually only get so far. So don't, you know, don't be afraid, I think, to ask for help, but just try and be really specific about that help that you're asking for. So if you are thinking about a project that's particularly kind of scary for you, go and ask some people for help on that specific project and on the bit that you might need the help with you know, seek out those people because you will find that most people enjoy helping other people and they want people to succeed. And so actually it's quite flattering to be asked, well, could you help me with this? Because I see you as a real expert. I don't have loads of knowledge. So I'm never going to be you in four weeks time, but actually I could be a little bit better if you could help me along the way. Yeah. Most people will respond pretty well to that in my experience. Yeah, I agree. Lovely. So I think we'll close it there. Hopefully some really useful advice for you in terms of fear of failing so that A, it doesn't feel quite as scary to fail in the first place. And secondly, when you do, uh, you know how to respond to it. Do remember that, as we talked about, this stuff is always hard. So take it one step at a time and recognise your progress as you go. So make sure you are also not just reflecting on your failures, but reflecting on those things that are going well, where maybe you thought you were going to fail and actually you didn't, because often they're the bits that we forget and we're too busy worrying about all the things that we didn't get right and forget all the things that actually a year ago or six months ago would have felt really hard and actually we've done a really good job of. And don't panic if something does go wrong or if you were hoping to volunteer for that scary project to put yourself in the position to fail a bit more and you don't do it the first time. It's okay to uh, kind of bottle it the first time round as long as the next time you're a bit more conscious of it and therefore a bit more likely to take some action. And keep sharing your gremlins with people you trust because they will help you along the way. So don't go it alone. And that's it for this week. Thanks again for listening to our Amazing If podcast. Uh, We really appreciate you tuning in every week. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe on iTunes to catch up on all of the 10-part series on Confidence Gremlins. If you want to find out more about overcoming the gremlins, you can buy our book on Amazon. And we'd always love to hear from you, both to get ideas for future podcasts, to get any feedback on confidence gremlins, any ideas you might have for how you've overcome fear of failure um, or any of the other gremlins in the series. And you can tweet us at amazing underscore if. That's all for this week. Have a good week and bye. Bye.